Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to all the respected faculties and doctors who've connected from India and abroad for Olympics third webinar on knowledge beyond boundaries. I am Atul Suri, and I represent Olympic Pharmaceuticals, a 113-year-old Indian pharmaceutical company. And I have the singular honor of welcoming our eminent panelists and respected participants to this international webinar. Big have always been at the forefront when it comes to knowledge sharing initiatives. We truly believe that knowledge is boundless and needs to be shared across the globe. Through this initiative, Alembic has brought to you renowned international and national faculties who shared their perspective and experiences on various topics of interest to gynecologists. Today, Alembic brings to you the third in the series of Knowledge Beyond Boundaries on the theme latest updates in hysteroscopy. We are indeed privileged to have with us a speaker of international repute who's beaming in all the way from Cleveland, the United States of America, none other than Dr. Linda Bradley, who has been honored as one of the top doctors of America. The, web the moderator for today's webinar is Dr. Niranjan Chavan. And who doesn't know Dr. Niranjan Chavan over here? But yes, we all know that he's the professor and unit chief of the Sion Hospital in Mumbai. He's also the National Coordinator, Foxy Medical Disorders and Pregnancy Committee, the Vice President of MOGS, and he's also been the Chairperson of Foxy Oncology and TT Company early, uh, Committee earlier. There is so much more about Dr. Chavan I can tell you about, but before I hand you over to him to moderate this very session, I must admit that I have seen him moderate two of Olympics earlier webinars, and I can say, that I'm yet to meet a moderator, the charm, wit, humor, and of course, professional depth that Dr. Chavan possesses. Let me not stand between you, him, and the lovely knowledge transfer initiative that Olympic has brought for you. Over to you, Dr. Niranjan Chavan. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Suri, and thank you, Alembic, to be our sponsor for this today's TOG webinar. We are very happy and proud to be associated with Maharashtra chapter of Indian Association of Gynecological Endoscopy, Cleveland Clinic, and AAGL. Mel Gibson, an advertising executive, acquires the ability to hear what women are thinking. He attempts to use this power to bring about a lot of changes in every woman and every life he touches. This was the movie What Women Wants. All movie buffs would remember that. And today we have a similar powered lady doctor from Cleveland Clinic, USA, who is going to tell all about your problems using her hysteroscope as her stethoscope. And she is none other than Dr. Linda Bradley from USA. Welcome, Dr. Linda Bradley. Amazing to see you and sharing the platform with our Indian people. You are not only live in USA, but you are live right now amongst Indian subcontinent. And I'm very happy to see you joining us on this Saturday weekend, 23rd of May, 2020. We are all in a lockdown period and we are all eager to hear. But I have to introduce you. We have been watched not only in the Indian Pacific area, but in SAR countries, in Southeast Asia, in Middle East, and we have got presently more than 2,800 doctors live now. And I assure you, as you speak, and as this program advances, we will be seeing more users logged in, and we are very excited. I will have to introduce you, madam. It's just your name that's enough. But you are a professor of OBGYN and reproductive biology at the Cleveland Clinic. Learner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. You have been appointed as a vice chair for the diversity and inclusion 
for the Cleveland Clinic Women's Health Institute and the Director of Hystroscopic Education for the Residency Program at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. You are already an internationally recognized gynecological surgeon, especially known for the diagnostic and operative hystroscopy like saline infusion, sonography, endometrial ablation, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Dr. Linda, to be here among us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Now, I would like to go ahead and introduce our Indian panelists. And they are none other than beautiful, gracious, elegant beauties with intelligence and superb knowledge. They are going to share with us a wonderful panel discussion on medical management of AOB. And we have none other than our own Dr. Hema Divakar. You all know that she is the president of FOXI 2013 and FOXI ambassador to FIGO, vice chair FIGO, GDM working group. She is also the chairman of Artist and a wonderful person, a very good human being. Welcome, Dr. Hema Divakar, madam. Thank you, Niranjan. Thank you, madam. Dr. Reshma Pai, madam, is our president of Mumbai Obstetric and Gynecological Society. She is also the president of FOXI 2017, ISAR, IAG, and presently she is the assistant treasurer of International Federation of Fertility. She is consulting in Lilawati, Jaslok, Hinduja, Healthcare Hospitals. Welcome, Dr. Reshma Pai, madam. Dr. Nandita Palshetkar, our professor in obstetric and gynecology, D.Y. Patel Medical College. Currently, she is the president of all Maharashtra Obstetric and Gynecological Society. She is the director of Bloom IVF, which has got more than nine branches spread all over India. A wonderful human being. She was also our past president of FOXI, MOGS, IAG, chairman of MSR, and vice president of ISAR. She has written more than 150 chapters, received 18 awards. She will be joining very soon with us. Thank you, Dr. Nandita. Dr. Shanta Kumari, the Iron Lady of India. She is the president-elect of FOXI 2021. She is presently working in Yashoda Hospital in Hyderabad. And she is also the member of FIGO Working Group on Violence Against Women. She's also the IAG member of the managing committee and she has to her credit FRCOG, FRCPI, Royal College of Physicians of Ireland and also initiated DERA, a socio-medical campaign to eliminate violence against women. She has got many awards and we remember her as a lady who organizes conferences in South India, that is HICC Novotel. She has organized many, many conferences of the stature of AICOG, FOXI, FIGO. Welcome, Dr. Shanta Kumari. Thank you, Niranjan. And the last and the most important person, India, Dr. Alka Kumar. She represents us at International Forum. She is working presently from Jaipur. She is like member of IAG, a member of the AAGL. She has got pioneer work in hystroscopy. She has got written many articles in the journal of AAGL and also contributed in, as in research, invited faculty at various national and international meetings. And she is the inventor of 11 technologies related to hystroscopy. We are going to hear from her a consensus statement of use of hystroscopy in COVID-19 times. Welcome, Dr. Alka Kumar. Thank you very much. So today, we have made history. This time is a wonderful history where AAGL joins with Maharashtra chapter of IAG and we have a total woman power platform. I'm the only guy who is man or out. But I think this whole platform and the whole discussion is going to be dedicated today to the women power and the women of this world. Now I hand over the mic to Dr. Linda Bradley to start her lecture 
and we are very happy to see you. Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. And it brings it brings me extreme joy to be here today with you. I only wish I was there. And to be asked to speak on something that I could speak to you for hours, uh, but limit it to 20 or 25 minutes, it breaks my heart. But let me try to tell you why my hysteroscope is my stethoscope. And uh, this will be an inclusive discussion, mostly videos, lots of pictures, um, how we as physicians should be using this technology. I did list my disclosures that are here. And today I would like to demystify and help you understand the challenges of office hysteroscopy. Look at the inside of the uterus and be able to visualize the most common anatomic abnormalities that you'll see and a few that many of us will just see once or twice in our lifetime and then give you some clinical pearls so that you can take what you've learned today and when you see patients the next week, be able to uh, begin doing hysteroscopy on your patients. So as I put together this talk, I, I thought about why and what technology we had and what similarities do we have to other specialties. Our stethoscope, as you know, we can listen to heart sounds, stomach sounds, carotid artery. We can listen for breweries. We can listen for lung sounds. But why don't we use a hysteroscope, something that allows us to look and evaluate the endometrium for its health? So I've entitled this talk, Our Hysteroscope is Our Stethoscope. And I hope that by the end of this, you'll see its clear benefits for our patient. Why will it be helpful? Because at the end of this lecture, we'll be able to share with you that really we should limit the number of times that we're doing blind biopsies, and we will hopefully direct you to think about targeted biopsy for removal of focal lesions. Also, it's a great experience for patients, and we'll see why. Your office staff does not really have to be specially trained. We'll look at new technology that's very simple to use. Some of it is even disposable. And it increases your efficiency and helps you to keep patients out of the operating room or ambulatory surgery center. And most importantly, what women want are minimally invasive surgery. So by doing hysteroscopy, it will help you to direct your surgical therapy, to talk with your patient about the informed consent and the complexity of surgery, and even tell you what instruments you should ask for so that you're ready and prepared. So what's the future? How can you use hysteroscopy? Well, for me, it has really made it possible that almost all of my surgical procedures now are hysteroscopic. Because of doing diagnostic hysteroscopy, it then adds to the surgical procedures that I do because of what I find on hysteroscopy. Definitely, it increases the scope of my practice. It helps with referrals a lot from my patients, but also for phys from physicians and colleagues. And more importantly, the scope of the practice, the number of cases that we're doing has increased in operative hysteroscopy. I think the hysteroscopy of, of the future will help us to decrease the number of cases of Ashermans because we'll be able to look and see pictures of retained products of conception, which happens a lot in women who are pregnant. And again, by doing office hysteroscopy, you can move on to complex intrauterine surgery. As you do more, uh, as we say, practice, practice, practice makes perfect, that the number of cases that we do will increase and your surgical confidence skyrockets and your ability to train others who um, we want to leave a legacy to also improves. The biggest issue, especially here in our state, as utilization of technology and specifically the operating room or the need to be in a surgical center. The images that we'll see today were really all taken from office procedures. Patients come in, have a brief procedure, go home, go back to work without time off of work and very little pain. If we think back many years ago, Pant uh, Pantaleone um, was censored. I think he lost his hospital privileges because they said that he was too nosy. What did he do? He had a 60-year-old patient with bleeding, and he put a scope inside to look, and he saw a polypoid lesion, and then he put silver nitrate in to treat that. But he was censored, but this was the first doctor who really looked inside the uterine cavity. 
And here we are 151 years later, and we are, are still, um, if I go back, we are still in the dark. We are doing blind biopsies. Many people are doing, are doing blind uh, DNCs using only transvaginal ultrasound, and we really want to be able to look in the cavity. This is a great picture of a 28-year-old woman that I saw who was very upset. And she told me, you know, Dr. Bradley, I am going to report you to the ombudsman's office if you give me another set of birth control pills or another DNC. I said, no, we're going to look inside. So this is a three millimeter flexible hysteroscope using hysteroscopic um, uh, device known as a hysteroinsufflator was for CO2. Again, not a laparoscopic insufflator, but a hysteroscopic insufflator. And I'm just looking at the inside of her uterine cavity. And I think there are about eight or nine lyomyomas. Some are kissing lesions right next to each other. Uh, she wants a baby in the future. An IUD is not going to fit in there. Birth control pills didn't work. And we certainly would not want to do a hysterectomy for this woman who has incessant bleeding. How does this inform me? I know that this may be a difficult case. I'm going to put in an intrauterine Foley catheter, give her high doses of estrogen for a month, take a catheter out in two weeks, and look again. So by looking in the office, it helps to prepare me and the patient for surgery. Another picture, large intrauterine fibroid. What do I want to know? I want to know it's there. I want to know what fluid management system I should use. I know that I want to use saline for this patient and not glycine. And I don't want her to go to the intensive care unit to have pulmonary um, edema, uh, to have a complication. And when I look inside the uterus here and then take her to the operating room, at the end, I did a resectoscopy. Everything's removed. This will heal over very well. Her heavy bleeding, her menstrual cramping, sometimes they have leukorrhea. All of that will get better. Likewise, this is a patient on tamoxifen being treated for breast cancer. Huge uh, polyp, endometrial polyp within the cavity, bleeding, staining, spotting, having leukorrhea, and afterwards, again, the entire polyp has been removed. While that patient had breast cancer, this could also be your patient that has infertility, and you want to leave the cavity clean and to know what device to use. Office hysteroscopy helped me. So we want to think outside of the box. There are no barriers. This is not difficult. There are thousands of papers that all of you who are on in the room have participated in writing. Um, it's not difficult. You don't have to be an expert. And there's been um, word that you don't get reimbursed for this. And that is definitely not true. In the U.S., sadly, office hysteroscopy is still not done by most doctors. In fact, a recent survey by the AAGL shows that 25 to maybe 50%, depending on what part of the country you're in, perform office hysteroscopy. And why are there barriers? Because people think about misconceptions, that the patient's going to be uncomfortable. You know, it's hard to teach doctors. How do we learn after we finish residency training or fellowship? So it, adult learning is, is not that difficult, but we have now simulators to treat this. We get reimbursed. And again, in the past, there weren't many companies that would have instrumentation for us to use. We know that's no longer true. These are all the indications for hysteroscopy, and I'm sure many of you can think of more. I, over the last many years, have found it very helpful for patients with abnormal bleeding in the reproductive years. We're now treating endometrial hyperplasia with high-dose progestins or the levonorgestrel IUD. We can follow patients up, look at their endometrium for health, take targeted biopsies. Even some cases at our institution um, are being treated with progestin or, or levonorgestrel IUD, those with endometrial cancer, and we can follow those patients hysteroscopically. A lot of patients with postcoital bleeding may not have a cervical ectropion, but has a small endocervical polyp or endometrial polyp that we can look at. Evaluate the endocervix for postmenopausal bleeding. Women are living half of their lives uh, in the menopause after age 50. So hormone therapy or just a life well lived sometimes leads to bleeding. Foreign bodies like IUDs, all the patients with infertility would benefit from looking inside. Watery discharge, uh, leukorrhea, 
can be evaluated. And increasingly, we know that there's a high rate of C-sections around this country and around the world. And so we're seeing retained products of conception, the C-section niche, which can cause bleeding, staining, and spotting. And again, these are all indications. And again, sometimes we use it for planning our operative hysteroscopy and endometrial ablation. And on occasion, we need to look at the endometrium following surgery after a big myomectomy, whether it's done open, laparoscopic, robotic, or hysteroscopic, looking on to determine if the patient has Asherman's. We do a lot of uterine fibroid embolization, also known as uterine artery embolization. We'll see a few pictures today of what could happen following that. But in-office hysteroscopy helps you to follow these patients who have alternative procedures like UFE, the Assessa procedure, or who bleed after an endometrial ablation. Yes, there are contraindications. Think about cervical cancer, someone with uh, cervical motion tenderness, a hot pelvis, acute pelvic inflammatory disease, pus in the uterus, obviously if the patient's uncooperative, if you um, or your team doesn't have experiment experience or the right instrumentation. Also, there have been a case or two report of death following a patient who had uh, hysteroscopy, who had active herpes. So do think about that and ask your patient those questions to make sure that she does not have a prodrome. And obviously, if the patient has a viable intrauterine pregnancy, this should not be done. The bottom line of office hysteroscopy, the patient loves it. It's time-saving, saves money. You don't need general anesthesia. Usually, I can't even think, I have not given local anesthesia in years, decades, um, but it's there for some people if you like it. You know exactly what you see is what you get. The patient knows, and sometimes you can do see and treat possibilities in your office if it's set up like that. And most importantly for me, I want to know what I'm going to need when I go to surgery. I don't want to open up five different surgical tools to use. I know I want to know if I'm going to use a resectoscope, if I'm going to use a tissue retrieval system. What do I need in my toolbox on the day of surgery? So again, lots of um, time save, minimal discomfort. And don't forget that you can also look in the vagina. So these are all bottom line benefits for office hysteroscopy. Here, this, um, I looked, this is a patient. She had a large type zero uh, intracavitary fibroid. And in my skill set, I'm able to tackle that with a resectoscope. And it shows by the pre-op evaluation, I could talk to the patient. We took out surgically a 90 gram um, large fibroid and she did well. The other thing is you're going to be successful most of the time. Your failures are very low. The patient doesn't faint often. Rarely would you perforate, rare complications. And now that we're using mostly saline, your risk for ga gas or air emboli are very low. Now, we teach that you should examine a patient, do a pelvic exam, but you can't tell what's inside that uterus. So for us, for patients like this, this was a picture of a patient decades ago who now I would treat this hysteroscopically. I would try to remove this with my resectoscope because I know what's there. Likewise, this is a sad hysterectomy that this patient ended up with having just this lesion here, a focal lesion, and ends up with a hysterectomy. That could have been treated because in the office, if I looked, I would have seen that. And again, we will be busier than any of our colleagues because four or 500 menstrual cycles in a lifetime, changes in color, smell, amount, duration, Women will complain that they have heavy bleeding and that their quality of life is poor. So we'll be busy. And I'm just going to really go through this quickly. You know, the word DNC, dilation and curatage, at the Cleveland Clinic, we now call it dead and cremated. This is an old surgery that by itself really should be abandoned and outlawed. It is not very effective, as we can see with these numbers. It doesn't sample the endometrium uh, fully, and it has many, many limitations. What about endometrial pipel biopsy? In the US, 2.2 million are performed, but I also say it's worthless unless you pick up cancer or unless you pick up atypical hyperplasia. Yes, use it if you wanna date the endometrium, but do not use it if you're thinking for a focal disease. It only samples 4% of the endometrium. If you had a health condition, would you want your doctor to only be able to look at 4% of a problem in an area of your body? Absolutely not. 
And again, where is the lesion? Is the uterus normal? Um, again, very, very limited information from pipel biopsy. And be the beauty of hysteroscopy is that we're now using instruments that we're all used to. This is the IUD, the SIS catheter, the pipel. These are our workhorses, the flexible hysteroscope. Um, and then this is our Hagar dilator, all tiny. Again, here we see now very, very small devices. We can look. Some of these devices are disposable. There's uh, three to four millimeters. You can look inside, and we're going to see pictures in just a minute of what this technology allows us to do. And the patient's very, very comfortable. Here we see the endo-C system. We now have the new, new ability to do targeted biopsies. Again, an in-office procedure. I'm just going to go through some of the new technology that we've used at the Cleveland Clinic disposable systems. This is a new one I'm actually going to try out in the next weeks once the coronavirus epidemic has passed and we can get folks in our office. But again, just knowing that there's technology that's out there. And yes, we still have our old workhorse that are getting smaller and smaller, the rigid hysteroscopes with ancillary ports that also allow us to look, take a rigid, uh, take out um, IUDs, do targeted biopsies. So now we're going to just look at some pictures. I wish I could pass some popcorn around if we're in a movie, but let's just see what's visible. When I was trained as a resident, we did not do hysteroscopy. So I consider myself self-taught. This technology was not there. And the first probably 50 cases, I put a scope in. I knew by going to the AAGL meetings that there was new technology. And I said to myself, I am going to learn how to do this because I wasn't taught this. In the first 50 cases, all I saw was red, the Japanese flag sign. But as you get better, this is a, a hysteroscopy in the office using a flexible scope, using the CO2, going into the endocervix. This woman presented with abnormal bleeding. She was menopausal. This is atrophy, diffuse petechial hemorrhages. You can see the tubal ostea. Atrophy is atrophy is atrophy. She could be on Depo-Lupron. She could be on long dose, uh, doses of Danazol. She could be on long-term breastfeeding. The endometrium gets thinner and thinner and thinner. We also are looking at the endocervix. She's bleeding because the tissue is just dry. And if you did a pipel biopsy, there would be nothing there. So again, looking is beautiful. Another quick picture, the diffuse petechial hemorrhages consistent with atrophy, and you just determine with the patient whether treatment with estrogen is needed. These are the tubal ostea. Some people are starting to look at technology that allows us, believe it or not, to look into the tube, to take samples of fluid from the tube. In the old days, we could plug the tubes to prevent pregnancy, um, but you know that device uh, is now off the market, market. But again, you can see beautifully. This is pictures from Dr. Kumar, but you can see the beautiful entrance into the cervix. You can see calcifications within the cervix. I'm just moving through. Sometimes we'll see as you get ready to look, this patient could have presented with bleeding. Uh, this is the ectocervix. If she had sex, this would be touched. It would bleed. And we know that the polyp, if you just twisted this off, we know that more of that polyp could be inside. And one out of four people who has an ectocervical polyp has endocervical polyps. So we want to retrieve everything and take care of that patient. Beautiful images of polyps that are vascular that we can see. Just more and more cases. In fact, more cases of polyps are present in women who are menopausal, symptomatic, who have a polyp. Anywhere from 3 to 6% of polyps can have cancer. Younger women, luckily, the risk of polyps or hyperplasia within a polyp is quite low, less than 1%. So again, um, multiple endometrial polyps. This is just a uh, office um, hysteroscopy using saline. So again, if you go in with a blind DNC, you might pull out one or two of these. But isn't it nice to know that you can get all of these Get, leave the endometrial cavity no, normal and that she will have resolution of bleeding, help her with fertility and many different things. So again, seeing is believing. I'm just going to move on. The second thing is don't forget that the uterus is a potential space. So when we put the scope in, whether we put saline or CO2, we can push lesions into the myometrium and miss it. I always put this picture in is that like a yo-yo, the uterus is dispensable, uh, distensible, and you want to put fluid in and fluid out so that you make sure that you're seeing everything. More pictures of 
multiple uh, lyomyomas, a pipel biopsy is not going to take care of that. Right now, I have a resident looking at over 2,000 of our cases to show that the pipel biopsy done weeks or months before surgery never picks up a fibroid. And if you said that the pipel biopsy was negative, just think of what you would miss and be unable to treat. This is a patient with an endocervical polyp. Um, this is um, where it's attached right here, the stalk of it. It's pretty broad base. Um, it's, uh, it's coming um, now into the endocervix. And as we come all the way out, you're going to see this mass at the cervix. It's firm. Uh, we're just underneath coming out, uh, looking at the endocervix. And now we see this large fibroid. For me, I never just twist this off in the office. And I have to uh, tell you, my first case, uh, one of the first cases I did, I twisted this off and the patient bled like crazy. We had to get her from our office to the OR. No, if I see this, I'm going to put my hysteroscope in, flexible in the office, find out where the base is. Is it a stalk? Is it thick? And right here, we can see that this has a very thick stalk. So I would take her to surgery and cut this stalk off right here and make sure this whole thing that I get that out. But don't twist that because you'll either leave a remnant and she'll still have the problem or you will have hemorrhage in front of you. Again, you can tell this patient, what has she had before? Multiple DNCs that have led to all of these adhesions. A blind DNC is never going to get that out. So can you begin to understand why your hysteroscope is your stethoscope? Cystic uh, adenomyosis, those gland-like openings that we can see. And depending on where you are in the cycle, these are gland-like openings. So blood, you can see blood sometimes going in there. Uh, this is not the opening to the fallopian tube. Make sure you're just looking at everything to know your landmark. Other pictures of adenomyosis, you can sort of see the bruising that is here. Intrauterine adhesions. You know, I'm not going to do a talk on adhesiolysis. I know there's lots of cases, but we can treat that very simply. This came from a, uh, the hysteroscopic um, newsletter that we have. This patient is very interesting, had two DNCs, and someone put a hole in the uterus. And you can see this is actually the, uh, the fimbria um, uh, within the uterine cavity that got sucked in or put pulled into the uterus. So again, that's once in a lifetime images that I borrowed. Uh, endometrial ablation is pretty common, um, not perfect as a surgical procedure, can lead to scar tissue and fibrosis and regrowth of tissue, but this is what it looks like afterwards. I like to do hysteroscopy to see if I can look inside. With that case, there's no way I could put an IUD in and we'll t we could talk about treatment for that, but this is what it looks like. Very, very narrow concentric fibrosis and um, helps you in planning uh, uh, treatment for this patient or next steps. This is a picture of a patient who had postmenopausal bleeding and I went inside to, to look. She'd only had a small amount of bleeding. We just dilated the cervix up and we see all of this uh, blood. I see it looks like Niagara Falls or Victoria Falls. We just lots and lots of blood that came out. It's just pouring out. Now, I would tell you, I, that particular day, I did not do the hysteroscopy. I had to empty the cavity. It'd be very difficult to see. Once in a while with an endometrial ablation or someone with adhesions, you'll get lots and lots of bleeding. That particular patient, I actually ended up putting in um, a urine cup to catch how much blood. It ended up being 700 cc's of a hematometria. And then a week or two later, I went back and hysteroscoped her. Again, many, many possibilities for our hysteroscope as our stethoscope. You can see focal endometrial hyperplasia here and take targeted biopsies. I'm just going to move through. Again, pictures of complex endometrial hyperplasia uh, with atypia. Endometrial cancer has multiple views. It can look um, like the cerebellum. It can have nodular changes. It can be friable. You can have more blood vessels. It can be irregular, polypoid, many, many different uh, ways that it looks, but just a few pictures here. Again, we can see there. Again, for IUDs, uh, if someone's bleeding, this is an IUD right in, inside of a cavity, uh, but there's a polyp. So we know that in the US, we use the Mirena a lot for abnormal bleeding. If they bleed before I would use a Mirena or um, a levonorgestrel IUD, I would take a look because her bleeding is not gonna be improved with an IUD. 
We can also see foreign bodies. Uh, at the clinic, we see people from all over the world. This is a patient from China. Her IUD, they don't put strings in. This patient did not know she had it, and she was wondering why she wasn't getting pregnant. So again, we now have our graspers, and we would be able to remove that. This was the hysteroscopic uh, implant known as Eshore. Sometimes it's malpositioned. This technology or surgery is no longer done, but you may have occasion in the future to see these coils inside the uterus. That's not a broken off IUD, but that is the hysteroscopic sterilization device. And again, taken from the hysteroscopy journal as a calcification within um, a um, Eshore device. Very, very interesting, once in a lifetime thing that you might see. Uh, I just saw this also, um, patient had a C-section, kept bleeding, staining, and spotting, and lo and behold on hysteroscopy. Unfortunately for this patient, the doctor left in a sponge, okay? And that's why she had leukorrhea and bleeding. You can almost see the blue tape from the sponge. That's obviously not good, but at least after months and months, could figure out why the patient had a problem. And what about pregnancy? Lots of pregnancies in the U.S., 4 million per year. All pregnancies don't go right. Miscarriages, termination, uh, pregnancy-related complications. And we know that in first trimester abortions, 0.5% of women will have um, retained products, uh, 1% of term pregnancies, and up to 5% when we medically manage a miscarriage or spontaneous abortion. These patients will continue to bleed. And the beauty of hysteroscopy is that you can see how much tissue is there. And then my personal belief is that in the future, we should absolutely stop using sharp curettage to remove this, but rather use a tissue retrieval system so that we do not create adhesions in these women who want future babies. This was a patient of mine who had had a baby. Uh, I don't no longer deliver babies, but for seven months, she bled every day. She was placed on multiple birth control pills, had a DNC. And you see what she had inside was this big retained product of conception. I took her to surgery because I knew what to expect and we removed it and her bleeding vanished and went away. Again, our hysteroscope definitely allows us to evaluate the endometrium. Last, uh, let's also just look at the isthmus seals. In the U.S., at some hospitals, a third of surgeries, a third of deliveries are by C-section. And what can happen is that uh, you develop a C-section niche, okay, where blood can accumulate, at least irregular bleeding, staining, sometimes spotting, pain with intercourse, suprapubic pain. If we did a hysterectomy, you can see what that C-section niche is, and basically blood accumulates, and these patients have bleeding. So we can see that hysteroscopically as well as by MRI and as well as by um, ultrasound, but this would also just help you in management of those patients. This is a case of mine that was published in the Fertility Sterility um, Journal. We used to call this arterial venous malformation. And I would say when you put a hysteroscope in, this patient presented after an abortion, continuing to bleed. It was thought that she had retained products of conception. So let's just remember, there's nothing ever yellow in the uterus, meaning that you perforate it, and you should never see anything pulsating. So this is, uh, in the old terms, we called it AV malformation. Now it's called EMV, enhanced myometrial vascularity. No, do not go in and put a suction DNC or try to scrape this off. Rather, this patient was transferred to our radiology center, and she had embolization um, of this, and uh, her bleeding um, was, was solved. I hysteroscoped her uh, weeks or months later and it healed up beautifully. So this is just to remind you with so many miscarriages, instrumentations, abortions, if you look, don't do, do anything if you see pulsations. Hydropic um, villi from molar pregnancies. This is a case of mine. I still um, am in contact with this patient. She bled for 25 years. Every doctor she saw wanted to do a hysterectomy. And she saw me, I did a hysteroscopy, and I looked inside, and I just said to myself, I had never seen whatever this was. And I ended up pulling this out, and I touched it and held it up and looked at it. It turned out to be a piece of Mersaline tape, the tape that you use to tighten or close the cervix. She had a cerclage when she was pregnant with her last child, 
And she says, when I pulled it out, I asked her, had she ever had a cerclage? She says, oh, yeah, I forgot with my last son, I had a, a cerclage. The doctor couldn't find it. So what happened, this eroded inside the uterine cavity. It became a foreign body, creates chronic endometritis, and she bled all the time. And I took this out. The bleeding stopped. Again, this is from Dr. Uh, Arthi uh, Chokuri Singh. Some people are using this for embryoscopy if a patient has a pregnancy loss. This is baby with cystic uh, hygroma. Bony ossification. Uh, we see these plaque-like changes within the cavity that also create lots of prostaglandin, lots of bleeding, a chronic endometritis, difficulty getting pregnant. And again, lots of times we can see fetal bones, uh, pictures of that. And these, again, you can take out uh, hysteroscopically one by one in order to empty the cavity and help that patient. We do a lot of UFE, and I'm just going to uterine fibroid embolization where the radiologist blocks the flow of blood to the fibroids and they shrink. But to have a great um, department, and I've worked collaboratively with our doctors, we've done over a thousand cases, but you have to have an excellent gynecologist for patients who undergo UAE or UFE, because sometimes these fibroids in the myometrium get pushed into the endometrium. This is just an MRI showing a large myoma dilating the cervix. You see the uh, fibroid coming here. You see all of this leucorrhea, this yellow-green discharge of the fibroid expelling. So they can have tissue fragments weeks, months, or years later. Um, you can look and see and to be able to take this out. This is an office hysteroscopy on a patient just like that. She had no bleeding, but just complained of a foul-smelling discharge. This fibroid that we see on the inside is dyed. It's left to a chronic leucorrhea. It's a necrotic fibroid. So we can just hysteroscopically remove that. It takes care of her bleeding, the foul discharge. And that came from an embolization procedure. So again, rather than saying the embolization didn't work, now let's do a hysterectomy. No, just take out the, the fibroid that's there in the patient's font. Again, some other post-UFE findings. This is why we don't want women to get pre try to get pregnant or they should not want fertility. You can get calcifications, you can get scar tissue, and again, you can get these sinus tracts that develop. This was a patient after embolization that I looked at, and we now know that we can scrape these um, lesions away. But just again, after embolization, we can see that. This is what, when we do the resection, I first thought this was caviar. I didn't know what these little balls were, but these are the emblospheres that are used um, during embol uh, UFE. So we know this goes to the endometrium. Another reason why we do not want to offer UFE to women who want children because it can lead to scar tissue and it can make it difficult to get pregnant. Again, this is another patient following a UFE who develops scar tissue, necrotic tissue on the inside and also narrowing. So pregnancy would be difficult. We know there's a high rate of miscarriage, bleeding, retained products, and even the need for um, cesarean hysterectomy following embolization because of poor placentation, placenta creta, and creta, and acreta. You can see a uterine septum. Uh, you can see a little piece. You can do vaginoscopy and see uh, with your hysteroscope and see uh, adenoma, I'm sorry, uh, endometriosis. We do a lot of saline infusion sonogram. This is a thickened endometrium. The lady had multiple pipel biopsies or stripe endometrial echo, I should say, is 12 millimeters, bleeding and menopause. She was 70 years old, negative biopsy, negative biopsy. We did a saline infusion sonogram. We can see the three lesions, one, two, three. And when I took her to surgery, here's the one, two, and the third lesion that's here. So again, we can see. Transvaginal ultrasound kind of doesn't give you a great picture. You put your hysteroscope in there, and what you see is what you get. This is, looks like a tongue, and we can then do a resection to remove that. I just look at all of these pictures, and I just call these sad, sad cases of hysterectomy. In our country, as you know, one out of three women by the age of 60 has a hysterectomy. Only 10% are for cancer. I look at these cases that were in our files. Every single one of these cases could have, could have been treated with a hysteroscope. Yes, they bled, and they could have bled a lot. Yes, they had postmenopausal bleeding. But knowing what's in there, by using your trusty flexible scope or rigid scope, 
you could have then taken her to the OR to remove these focal lesions. So it makes me sad. So again, seeing is believing. Our hysteroscope is our stethoscope. And what I'd like to challenge you to do is to make the hysteroscopic journey for the betterment of women's health care, for your practice, for you, for your patient. And now is the time to be an advocate and to take action, to dare to be different, to be an advocate, to take a new road, to be a voice of change. And let's make this a revolution that hysteroscopy is a state of the art for women who have indications for it and that blind technology should be thrown out the door. And I would conclude to say that utilization of hysteroscopy will decrease the need for blind biopsy. It'll help you to take out those targeted lesions, a great experience for our patients, we will do far fewer hysterectomies for things that we can easily treat. You don't have to have a fancy office staff to use the technology and a big positive impact on office flow and efficiency. So embrace your hysteroscope as your stethoscope. It'll take you far. And I think we will improve the health care of women uh, in our community. And I thank you uh, for asking me to participate in this seminar and series um, I could have gone on and on for a long time. I may have gone over a little bit, but I hope that you get a sense of what's possible, what's doable, and we must move ahead. 28% of doctors using this technology is not acceptable. We need to leave a legacy. We need to train. All of our organizations working together can bring about uh, phenomenal changes, and it can happen and be revolutionary overnight. We now have simulation Bring another doctor. If you're doing hysteroscopy in the office and OR, bring a colleague to the OR with you. Yesterday, I had two with me, and they were fascinating, fascinated by what they could see. And so I think each one helps one. And as we say here, reach back and pull up so that we can help others. I thank you again for this kind invitation. Thank you, Dr. Linda. It was... Thank you a wonderful presentation. You are an encyclopedia of hysteroscopy and the amazing collection you have of the films starting from simple office hysteroscopy going to benign conditions and very rare conditions like a bone or a gauze or the retained products of conception and then going towards cancer, see endometrium. And so wonderfully, you have taken us through this beautiful lecture that we are enthralled by your speech. Thank you so much. Well, we thank you. Next, next time, if I had three hours and I've now had a chance to put together with the coronavirus a lot of videotape of things that I forgot that I'd ever seen. So I'll have to come back again. Madam, we are not going to leave you. You're going to be with us. So All please right. stay back and be here and we will continue the discussion further. There okay. are many Thank questions you. which are there and I would like to put here on record that we have got more than 3,480 live registered users. So we have swelled up now much more, especially after your lecture. Thank you. So we will see you soon. I'm going okay. back to Dr. Alka for her wonderful presentation. Dr. Alka, please come online. Yes, I'm very much online. Thank you. Today, but in spite of that, you have joined. Some days back, I read this written statement by March Piercy, a social activist. A strong woman is a woman determined to do something. Others are determined not to be done. This is what I understand from what I read as we work to address the root causes, systematic injustices and the effects of issues, therapies, their management and improvisation. We know we cannot do this alone. It will take collaboration between public, private and non-profit entities. Together we are stronger. And that's exactly what these pillars of woman power, these ladies have brought in. 
innovation, improvisation, and indigenization. That's what who they are. So now we go ahead with our panel discussion on medical management of AOB, and I welcome all. I want to say here we have got more than three thousand five hundred registered users on this platform. and all of them are very eager to hear from you so we would like to start with our case discussion and i request dr nandita palshetkar madam to unmute her mic yes and yes. let us see the first case thank you thank you, thank you so much <clears throat> i think uh, with all the description that you've given of us all women we are like gung ho to get going thank you made me feel very good Can I have the slide with the case? <coughs> I think uh, today uh, I have been uh, told to discuss uh, infertility. You know, for twenty-five years, I'm doing only that. Twenty-five plus years, actually. So this is something very close to my heart. And endometriosis is something which I really am passionate about and done a lot of work. And this is a patient who is twenty-six years old. she has a low amh she has a left sided ovarian endometrioma and heavy menstrual bleed i think when a patient becomes symptomatic it becomes very crucial that we have to chain uh, treat the patient immediately otherwise there are different ways in which you can handle these patients with uh, endometriosis so now this is a patient who is symptomatic a uh, tbi shows a 5 by 6 by 4 cm uh, endometrioma so obviously the diagnosis is menorrhagia probably following endometriosis <coughs> so how do you manage this case i think uh, there are two three points which we must keep in mind first that she is very young age is very very important second is infertility that means she definitely wants to conceive the third point to remember is a low amh so the endometriosis has affected her ovarian reserve and her amh is low so these are the three important points that we keep in mind and she has a left sided chocolate cyst which is fairly large it's 5 by 6 by 4 cm <coughs> thank you and plus along with that she has heavy menstrual bleeding so we need to treat her uh definitely for a heavy menstrual bleeding so when such a patient is there who is young low amh and with such a big endometrioma i would actually prefer to give her medical therapy and i think your the role of progesterone really comes in that uh, you can give uh, dynogest or any other mpa etc for 21 days to maybe even 30 even continuously dynogest i would use continuously in this patient to control her heavy menstrual bleeding and a lot of my uh, patients with 2 to 3 months of therapy would come under control at least the uh, heavy menstrual bleeding would come under control and then she would be investigated with a husband semen and asked to conceive because she is young and of course in a young patient even though the low amh is there i would love to uh, put her for you know chocolate cyst treatment laparoscopically because if the chocolate cyst is removed well and uh, without causing much harm to the ovary it's unilateral it would definitely give her a very good chance at pregnancy but the first line of treatment is definitely medical line of treatments give her dynogest use a uh, uh, you know progesterone and the other point is even gnra analogs can be used in these kind of patients but right now in this 26 year old i would prefer progesterone any of the, the you know uh, esteemed panelists here would like to contribute anything would like to add to it i think it would really be good to have a open discussion yes dr linda Thank you for this great case. I would uh, I agree with you, but I would also add um I would not rely on a transvaginal ultrasound alone um for this patient um to explain her heavy bleeding. There's an excellent study. It's an old study, but old things are sometimes good by Dr. Brykoff who's now in May at the Mayo Clinic. Um who did a, a great study looking at transvaginal ultrasound immediately followed by saline infusion sonogram in young women and what they what he found is that one out of 5 women 
who has a quote, normal transvaginal ultrasound has something in the uterine cavity. The most common thing in someone young is a polyp. And we know that polyps are very elusive. They lie flat. And he went as far as to look at the endometrial echo to see, is there a number of millimeters for which in a young person, we know that the endometrium can range from four millimeters to 12 to 15 millimeters. And there really wasn't a number that he could decide whether you would miss a polyp. Um, so for the heavy bleeding, while we have a treatment and we know that she wants to get pregnant, let's not miss something in the cavity. The other thing I would either do if this patient came to me, this would be an ideal case. If you didn't do saline infusion sonogram or say, uh, SIS, um, then I would um, just do a hysteroscopy, but do it scheduled right after her menses is over in the early proliferative phase so that you don't get a false positive result. So I like what you said for the, the, the cyst, but the bleeding, of course, I'm gonna come back and say one more piece of technology, either office hysteroscopy properly timed or an SIS um, properly timed so that you get a really, really good image of the endometrial health. I think, Linda, it's good that you got me back to, uh, you know, ground level. Okay, we must not just go only on the sonography. And I think that's a very good uh, suggestion that for heavy menstrual bleeding, I think uh, the saline sonography or the office, we do the office hysteroscopy more often than the saline sonography. And I think it would be worth doing. And the point to be noted, what she has actually said is post-menstrual. Because, uh, you know, the endometrium will be thinned out and we will be able to really identify polyps much better. I think Rishma wanted to add something. Yeah, Rishma? Yeah. Uh, basically, because she's infertile, she has pretty low AMH. Uh, it's important to not waste too much time with prolonged medical therapy before we start her on infertility treatment. So maybe a system of doing a tubal check could be just a simple HSG. And if the semen test is normal, maybe start directly with uh, ovarian stimulation, uh, IUI, or something to accelerate pregnancy. And anyway, in the luteal phase, support her with progesterone as a luteal phase support, which that would that would help anyway in reducing her menstrual bleeding. So if she's not pregnant in that particular cycle, you've given her two weeks of progesterone, maybe diadrogesterone, maybe micronized progesterone. So as it is the period that she will get after that, hopefully will be much less heavy because of the progesterone. And if she does become pregnant, then anyway, the issue of heavy menstrual bleeding is sorted. So uh, to not waste much time on prolonged medical therapy, I think we should try because nowadays the consensus is that even if there is an endometrioma, uh, pain being the major issue for surgery, if pain is not a major issue, we can actually go ahead and try for fertility directly without wasting much time. I think this is a totally different approach. And uh, if it works well, I think why not? But my uh, argument was that she's 26. She's young. You know, we can actually... No AMH. That's the only point. Yeah. Yes. But uh, it's a very different uh, way to look at the patient. And I think thank you for that input, Rishma. It's really uh, taken a different turn. So we have three different ways in which you can actually go. Great. Anybody else yeah. wants to add anything? Yeah, Niranjan? I think uh, that's what is the way we look at because uh, individual and a different perspective towards a case will open up the Pandora's box of the uterus, you know, and I think we will now hear from Linda. Yeah, you know, I, um, I like to use a, a, a speech that I gave when I became president of the AAGL many years ago, and it was entitled, The Woman at the End of the Speculum. And as you frame today's discussion about what do women want, I think this case, we have lots of excellent discussion, but we really listen, whoever took this history, really listen to the patient. Um, and then we have to act on her complaints. So we may be in the mindset of fertility, but she's also telling us that her quality of life with her heavy bleeding is there. So sometimes I think we look at, I'm trying to think of the phrase, sometimes we don't see the trees for the forest. I mean, you have to look at the whole patient. She's asking us to treat everything. So that's why I'm bringing in the issue for the bleeding. And then if you do the surgery, maybe uh, she has a polyp, you can take care of that at the time that you do the laparoscopy. So let's look at the patient's chief complaints and not just narrowly focus on one thing. We've gotta be very broad 
and make sure we capture everything and answer her complete problem. The woman at the end of the speculum is who we take care of, not Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. So, Naranjan, do you want to go to the next case? Yes, yes. Thank you, Nandita, for that excellent presentation and the summarization of the three, uh, three views. Now, Dr. Shanta, the mic is yours. Please go ahead with the case two. Thank you so much. Yeah, Niranjan, thank you. I think we did have a wonderful discussion in the first case. And now uh, I see this case. She's a 33-year-old patient with heavy menstrual bleeding, but she has multiple submucous fibroids. But her hemoglobin is 7.6 grams. Ultrasound is showing two submucous fibroids, 2 into 3 into 3, 3 into 4 into 2. Now, what is it that we would like to do? Now, what is it I would like to do? So, I all of us would, would definitely agree that we would like to first correct her hemoglobin. So, 7.6 grams, ideally, I would put her on parent lion therapy. So, that is the way we can build up uh, the hemoglobin in this patient. And probably we'll, we'll have to wait and see whether it was not only the fibroids which have contributed to this heavy menstrual bleeding, it could be the vicious cycle of anemia and the fibroids, you know, which is an interlinked that could be the cause of the bleeding. So what do I do with this patient? I'm trying to build her uh, hemoglobin, but she's bleeding. So my first take is, I'm sure all of you will agree, we would like to stop the heavy menstrual bleeding. I can't go and give the patient to Linda or Alka right away or take her into the OT. I would like to first stabilize her bleeding till I build her up the uh, hemoglobin. So ideally, yes, progesterone is the way we would like to start off. And now the question is, which progesterone? We've got a basket of progesterones available. Everyone has, we have been hearing about progesterones the past 60 years. And every time a new progesterone is being added, but when it comes to heavy menstrual bleeding, we would like to know which is the progesterone we'd like to use. So if you, if you ask me personally, I would always like to start off the first month when the patient is having so much of uh, anemia and the heavy menstrual bleeding, put her, put her on a norethisterone. Now, norethisterone is a very good progesterone, which will definitely contain the bleeding. But friends, remember norethisterone is a drug where you have to use it for limited um, uh, uh, number of days. For the first cycle, put her on norethisterone. Once the, the cycle is controlled, then probably you can actually shift her on to the other progesterones which are available. There's so many other uh, progesterones, the medroxyprogesterone estate, you've got sometimes the micronized progesterones, then the other progesterones. So this particular patient, now I've corrected, I've given a parent lion. We will give her uh, FCM, IV. But remember, when you're giving parent lion, always give your patients folic acid and methylcobalamin combination also. Because what we find is in our country, we have our patients who have deficiency of methylcobalamin and folic acid. And that is very important along with your parent lion. So friends, now we have given her and uh, within one month, her uh, bleeding is... Uh, sort of contained. Now, what am I going to do? I'm very lucky. I have the two great hysteroscopic ladies with me in the team. And as Linda rightly said, in our profession, always remember, everyone is good. It is not that only I, me, myself. If I think Linda can do a better job, if I think Alka can do a better job, yes, I would definitely ask them to please come into the OT and manage this patient. So can I ask uh, Dr. Linda? followed by Dr. Alka, how is it that you would like to deal with this patient? So yes, I Linda. like your, oh, thank you. I love your approach. Um, here in the States, um, we would uh, do two things, uh, very similar. I think that the IV iron is a great option. We would also add, um, have the patient to Google foods that have high sources of iron, add vitamin C, 500 milligrams a day to increase iron absorption. And if she has regular, heavy, predictable periods then I, and has no risk factors, I would put her on tranexamic acid when she's on her period. Uh, we were a part of a study many years ago here at the Cleveland Clinic, and it was also published by uh, Dr. Andre, uh, Andrea Lucas um, to show that about 70 to 80% of patients who have heavy bleeding, when put on Lystata or tranexamic acid for five days, their bleeding gets better. 
So her iron count, if she eats well, we can slow down the bleeding. It will bounce up with 10 to 12 days. Then I would want to, to know to make sure that this is the right surgery for this patient. When we have the ultrasound, I really want to do an, a saline infusion sonogram. We need to have a FIGO classification. Does she have a type zero? Does she have a type one or a type two glioma? Because sometimes when we do a regular ultrasound or just put in a hysteroscope, we might only see the tip of the iceberg and that the fibroid really goes deeper. A four centimeter fibroid that's deep in the myometrium, a type two, we're gonna to talk to the patient in advance that we might not be able to finish surgery because the fluid that we use, even with the best fluid pump, may get absorbed and we may I, need to stop and do a two-stage procedure. So I want to have the classification. Tell me more about the fibroid. What classification is it? And I agree with you with the, uh, we don't have the same progesterone here in this country. We have megase and progest uh, or progesterol, but we're, I think we're on the same page with that, yeah. but a little bit more for the surgical approach. Rarely, if you don't have a good image, might you do an MRI? So this particular patient has, uh, we have put, I had put her on a parent lion, her hemoglobin has improved. Then we stopped the progesterone, she's again bleeding. Now that's uh -huh. the dilemma. So now if I leave her to bleed, she'll again become anemic. So I can't yeah, yeah. leave no, her I, to bleed. So no, I have, no, no, so I have, you would just start the surgery. Which, yes. But, so but I, is hysteroscopic surgery the right surgery? That is, the, that is, that is what mm -hmm. I want Linda and Alka to answer me, whether the surgery is the answer or is there anything else we can do? Yes, Alka, I find that you are very eager to join in. Please unmute. Yes, yes, Linda. Yeah, I think, Alka, this was excellent. Um, I always call her my sister from another mother. Um, <laughs> we often speak, and um, thanks for WhatsApp down through the years that we've had tough cases that I'll call her and say, you know, what would you have done? But let me add three things that I would also do that we may have here in the U.S., and I don't know what's abroad. So for all of my patients who are gonna undergo hysteroscopic surgery, as much as we love this classification system, whether it's by LASMAR or the FIGO classification system, sometimes a type zero is really not a type zero and it's a type one when we really get in there. All of my patients, uh, you, we use mesoprostol uh, for my fibroid cases and I use 400 micrograms by mouth two nights before surgery when they go to bed and at bedtime the night be before. Because one of the benefits of mesoprostol, in addition to making the cervix more patchless, it causes uterine contractions and it can push um, uh, a fibroid from the myometrium out. So it makes it more likely that I'm gonna finish. She spoke about fluid uh, absorption. I always use, and there's a great study many, many years ago using a dilute solution of vasopressin so we put 10 units of vasopressin in 100 cc's of saline and eject it circumferentially in the cervical stroma. What does that do? It's three things. If you ever get a tight cervix and you can't get in and it's taken the, even the cytotec, that it helps to dilate the cervix. It also decreases uh, bleeding, but more importantly with these difficult cases, it decreases in travisation of fluid. And then lastly, with our fluid pump, it's dynamic and we let the pressure up and we let the pressure down. It's like a yo-yo, that's what I was describing. Because that, and then sometimes I take out my hysteroscope and just wait five minutes. Um, and the myometrium just pushes the fibroid out. So whenever you think you're done with surgery, you're not done. Just wait, then put your hysteroscope back in, inflate again, and slowly let it out. So like Alka said, you want to be able to get that pseudo capsule out. And, you know, the, the vasopressin only lasts for about, or, um, about 20 to 30 minutes. So I use it liberally. Yesterday, I had a very difficult case. We started with it. 20 or 30 minutes later, I'm putting more in. And in that particular dilution, you know, in, in France, they don't allow vasopressin. Why? Because it's caused death. But when you look at how they, they're, they're so, they did not dilute it enough. So we've done, one of our former um, institute chairs, Dr. Falcone has done a study or looked at the literature. There's never been a complication where you take 10, unit, 10 units of vaso mixed in 100 cc's of saline and inject it. And you're always aspirating and slowly injecting. 
So some people do a one-to-one dilution. Some people do a one-to-five. No, that's not appropriate. So we have been very helpful. Uh, We've been very successful. No complications, helping us to complete the surgery. To me, the biggest tip is um, making the uterus go up and down with your fluid pump and using the um, Cytotec a couple of nights before. That has been, I I don't want to knock on wood, but I almost always finish my surgery without having to go back, without them going to the intensive care unit or having a complication. I mean, these three little things are pretty dramatic in terms of helping us to completely remove the, the pathology without having two or three surgeries. One step, one stop shopping is important. Yeah, Linda, that was a fantastic way of approach. Now, the basic doubt of many of uh, my friends over here is, how do I know when I need to stop the my resect, whatever I am removing, you know, in the stroscopy? That is a very important so that I don't go beyond a particular point. Now, how do they realize? Yes, I need to stop. Well, again, I respect everybody that's on the panel, and I have a big experience with doing post-op hysteroscopy. It's a technique I've used for 20-plus years. I really do not see um, post-op complications, scar tissue. I mean, we can talk about what that is. I personally, uh, with the two, with the Figo 1s or 2s, I go down to the pink myometrial fascicles, okay? You do not want to leave that world appearance of the fibroid behind because if they want to get pregnant, there's something in the cavity. The remnants will make them bleed. So again, that coming back with us for the three-hour hysteroscopy, I'd have to show you lots of pictures, but you can just see the beautiful fascicles. Um, You're keeping up with your fluid management and you're working promptly, but you get everything out. And it's just, it's visually a different texture of the tissue. Uh, And I personally, uh, I've done over 20,000 office hysteroscopies. I mean, compared to what other people may have done in my lifetime, it's a lot. But I, I always would look and in my early years of learning. I was like, okay, I do this surgery. What does it look like? You know, if you did a C-section, a, a scar somewhere, you could see it. So I would just pop in a hysteroscope a month later or two weeks later. It heals up very, very beautifully on the inside. So um, I don't know, Alka, do you look for those fascicles? Um, but Linda, uh, how do you? Oh, yes. I, can I just, uh, before Alka, I think what uh, Linda has told is a beautiful point for all the people who are learning, who are like at the beginning. You keep looking at different pictures. You need keep looking at many of the hysteroscopic views. Go and I think probably if you have colleagues and friends, seniors who are good hysteroscopic surgeons, please go and peep through their hysteroscope so that you get an idea of what it looks like. And that, I think, is a very important uh, point which you have shared with us. Yeah, and I also put a, you know, I'm medical director of the AGL, and I'll have to put a plug out for us. We have a great, um, if you're a member, the Surgery U platform with hundreds and hundreds of surgical procedures that are peer reviewed. You just can't put your pictures and videos on there. They're reviewed by a group of doctors for their excellence and their teaching purposes. So join the AGL also. You'll have access to Surgery U, and there's a whole um, library from laparoscopic to robotic to vaginal and to hysteroscopic to learn. Mm-hmm. So people can utilize the lockdown uh, period, which is little more time only. So in your free time, yeah. please log in, look at the pictures and learn to become as good or better than these two hysteroscopic surgeons. Surely better. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Linda, for your expert comments and the way Dr. Shanta, you have handled this case and the wonderful video presentation of Dr. Alka Kumar to go in the detail of how to go ahead with this presentation. So thank you so much. And before we go to the case three, I want you to show, uh, before we go to the case three, I want you to show the poll. We started with the poll in the beginning. It has been a surprise to all of you. I never told you, but there was an ongoing poll. And I want you people to know The poll is still going on. It will be taken at the end of the question and answer session where we will know the result. But they are based on four aspects. How is the scientific content of this poll? What is the technical content of this poll? Do you want a hysteroscopic session again? And it should be there for more than three hours. How do you rate? And this is what we have got the poll. 
excellent 46 percent very good 33 so you combine them it is more than a distinction and good so these are all the poll which we are doing it's still ongoing and we are getting the results of this do you enjoy the insight into hysteroscopy yes 91 percent have enjoyed dr linda dr alka thank you we are very grateful to you thank you and obviously you. our indian panelists who are doing a wonderful job do you want another detailed webinar on hysteroscopy 97 percent have said yes <laughs> they want one more session so we will be coming back to you all in june in the month of june and we will be having the same indian panelist the same woman power is going to join us <laughs> so we are not going to leave you thank you so much now i request to please show the case 3 dr hema divakar please join us hi again I think uh, it looks like uh, Dr. Niranjan wanted the hysteroscopic surgeons to take a short breather or a break. Therefore, he has put up this third case, which says it's a 22-year-old unmarried female who has a sub-serosal posterior wall fibril, 5 into 6 into 5 centimeter. So the treatment options that he's directed to me is uniprestol and what medical line of treatment. So before I go into the treatment options, I would like to ask myself one question three times. That question is why, why, and why? Okay. Why this unmarried 22-year-old female must have gone to a doctor in the first place and had a scan done? Okay. So with the scan report, which has revealed this, she has now seeking our help as to because anybody with such a large you know, even though it's not given her any trouble or did she really have any symptoms? That's the third why, okay? Why she must have gone to the doctor. So the location is sub but the size is rather big. Most likely, most likely that this patient may not have had any symptoms, in which case I should again ask myself again, why should I accept any option that Niranjan has thrown, either unipristol or medical line of treatment. Because typically, if there has been a heavy menstrual bleeding, then unipristol, yes, it's anti-progestogenic. So it will act on the progesterone receptors. Luckily, it acts only on the leomyomatous uh, progesterone proliferation and not on the normal tissues. So there will be definitely a reduction in the bleeding and also there will be a reduction in the size, etc., etc., with minimal side effects and Three months of uniprestol you give, five or ten milligram, and then you wait. Because if there is a size reduction, it will last maybe six to eight months. Then again, you may have to repeat the course, etc. So at the moment, I think that you know, sometimes to refrain from doing anything, just reassure the patient because she will certainly be psyched up. What do women want? That is the question that has been raised as a theme in this uh, discussion. So she may want that sub the fibroid out because she thinks there is something extra sitting there which will harm her. And even a half a centimeter fibroid, we've had women coming to us, this is an abnormal finding. Maybe this will turn into cancer. Maybe I just want this out. That's what the mindset of the patient may be. But the primary duty of us will be to reassure her, to keep her under observation, to see how this goes, whether there are other associated fibroid. Linda has been mentioning again and again, do a thorough scan or whatever additional tests are required because they, this may not be the only finding. There may be some little things here and there. So the assessment, reassurance and observation in a periodical manner is what would be my first choice. Having said that, if I do not think there is any role in this case for uniprestol, but broadly I have outlined that uniprestol in cases of heavy bleeding and to reduce the size, yes, that uh, could be an option apart from other line of conservative therapies like norethistron and other things that already Shanta has mentioned in the previous case for heavy menstrual bleeding, the same applies over here. So in short, that's all I would like to do for this case. Madam, if I may ask you, what is the role of HIFU? Because she is unmarried, maybe she is reluctant to go 
for a surgery obviously it is 5 cm it's a sub serosal fibroid she is having some amount of menorrhagia for which we have given her nacids ethymicylate maybe progesterone to reduce her uh, you know uh, help uh, to reduce her blood flow but that yeah, also yeah, and then high flow has not to the test of time uh, because uh, uh, when i had a, a, i was asking in an interview to one of the leading endoscopic surgeons in the country dr hafiz rehman and it was all about uh, uh, some reflections and some experiences as do you think uh, you have invested in something that was not appropriate what is that one thing that you can come out with can you share with us that experience because not everything that you would have done could have been right and then he said that investment of on haifu was a mistake okay he has had really you know the the experiences that he narrated and mm-hmm. of course the you know the experience with few uh, of the uh, experts in our own country who have used it has not made it stand the test of time and uh, uh, we um, would refrain from offering that methodology or option uh, to this young girl uh, as a treatment modality yeah may i shanta interject can i uh, yeah. <laughs> have yeah. a comment yes yes reshma yes, reshma please, please. Yeah. uh actually this is um, uh hema to uh, uh, put the other side of the picture mm-hmm. uh, i agree then earlier when ultrasound based uh, uh, uh treatment hifu was there uh it was not very very effective but since the onset of the mri guided focused ultrasound that is mrgfus things have definitely improved it so happens that india and particularly just lok hospital has the largest series in the world probably or at least the second largest for sure uh, mm-hmm. on uh, treatment of fibroids with mrg fus and uh, the results especially for a group of unmarried girls who don't even want that laparoscopy scar particularly in india you know how it is very very sensitive and arranged marriages are there and they have to explain a scar on the abdomen Uh, in those type circumstances uh, mrgi fps playing a real good role because it has taken away some of the disadvantages and uh, sort of negatives of the ultrasound where you couldn't actually see the depth you could measure the temperature you couldn't uh, assess as you went along with mrgi fps you can actually have a temperature on the point you can see the depth you can avoid nerves intestines anything on the way scar tissue and as you go along you can see the area that you have treated so it's a uh, and now with quite a few years of expertise uh, results are rather good yeah. so i agree that this particular girl maybe doesn't even need any kind of intervention yeah. of course so i'm totally with you on that and medical treatment is always the first line always but um, in select cases if we have to intervene uh, for this kind of a group a very young girl uh, mrg might be a good option Yeah, thank you, Reshma, for that uh, viewpoint. As uh, Niranjan said, always different perspectives adds uh, value to our own understanding. Yes, when there is a quest for better and better methods uh, with lesser and lesser side effect and more and more advantages, that's what anyone would uh, look for. But um, uh, the basic uh, philosophy of uh, you know the uh, high flu is appropriate, but the intervening uh threats of uh, the damage to so many things and the fertility uh, going further all those were questionable so that uh, yeah, needs yeah, a yeah, rethink yeah, but yeah, in yeah, this yeah. particular case if we are addressing this particular case most likely that um, uh, we uh, should uh, restrain from uh, doing anything for uh, just the uh, sake of it and Absolutely. keep her under observation given her age and given the fact uh, not given the fact niranjan has not told us what the kind of uh, uh, you know symptoms she has come with but we presume that because of this location uh, she may not have had uh, an experience of any untoward uh, symptoms so that's a good perspective and we look for uh, uh, watch this space kind of a uh, outlook on uh, the uh, mri guided uh, uh focused uh, ultrasound to dissolve the fibroids anything that would make the fibroids disappear uh, without uh, much invasion of course would be uh, welcome in the future yeah? thank you yes, can i add over here please 
Uh, yes. you know, MRFUS is a fantastic technique and now there are enough studies coming out. Last, uh, on the same CME, yeah. we had a, North, we had a uh, doctor from Korea who yeah. has done such a humongous amount of series as Vishma is talking about an Indian series. He was talking about his series yeah. and in fertility patients also you can do MRFUS. So I think it's always going to be a fight between the surgeons yes. and the uh, the radiologists, you know, or the technicians who are doing it because everybody, see, the surgeons are very good. As surgeons, we are very good at what we do. But sometimes the technology can be advantages, as Rishma said, you know, there'll be no scar on the abdomen and fertility is also not affected. So there, are, there is a lot of studies in literature now where they say MR guided FUS and fertility, no problem at all. So I think, first of all, this patient does not require it. That's my personal opinion, which I think everybody is said that yes. but uh, MR guided FUS I think we can really beg to defer on it and there will always be a surgeon who will say no I would prefer to do surgery rather than you know go for this technology Yeah, because they love their fibroids remember that you ask Linda give it a chance Linda will put it in the scope and take it out in 10 <laughs> seconds <laughs> So nice. Thank you, Dr. Nandita. Different perspective. Thank you, Reshma, for your perspective on MRI, ultrasound. And uh, you know, this was a teaser, Viranjan. I know that uh, you know that this patient doesn't deserve it, but still he wants to put what do you think about <laughs> the HIFU? So it was a good point to be brought in because, as it is, you know, when you have a patient where you need to do nothing, then you have to really create a discussion on something more which we could do in the with the technology in other patients <laughs> yeah so what, what we you. know that we have to not do is <laughs> uterine artery embolization that we know for sure we will not do because that will cause a lot of damage to ovarian reserve a lot of damage to fertility so we are sure 100 percent on the page that we will not do uterine artery embolization for this yes patient. Very good. So Absolutely. finally, finally, we all know that we have one group of surgeons and we have got one group of non-surgeons who are actually ready to manage it on an equal footing. Very good. Yes. So uh, it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, I have seen in my OPD also that young girls are now having fibroids as young as 18, 20, 22, 24 they are very scared of surgery. They do not want to undergo any surgery. They want medical line of treatment. I remember that even if that fibroid reduces in size, they're happy. They're happy with some medical line of treatment. Doctor, I don't want any laparoscope to be put inside. I would refer. Can you suggest me some another some of them even come with their fiancé. They are getting married soon in six to eight months time. And they really are apprehensive for some surgery. So I think this medical line of treatment as Dr. Hema and Dr. Reshma Pai said is wonderful to be seen. And obviously, if this is an opportunity to be given to an endoscopist like me, I am not going oh. to lose that opportunity and to take her on the OT table and see that that fibroid is removed with a minimum scar. So let's see the video of a lap myomectomy for a few minutes. And then we come back to our infertility special. <laughs> slide. Please stop sharing this slide. And I request to you please reduce the sound. And it will be a wonderful way of seeing laparoscopic myomectomy. You can access my channel, Niranjan Chavan. There are more than 60 videos. And obviously, in this lockdown period, <laughs> the volume, please. Thank you. Please go ahead. This was a case of infertility with 5 to 4 centimeter fibroid. As we do a laparoscopic surgery, we still went ahead and put a hysteroscope because the patient is under anesthesia and we do not want to miss out any submucous fibroid. So it's always better that you put a hysteroscope. You can find here that this lady has fibroid and you can...
can see this is their scene in posterior wall. So obviously we had the use of pitri scene. We diluted, as Dr. Linda suggested before, how they go about to dilute this, and you can see the change in color of the uterus, and it becomes blanched. It becomes white. Then you just cut open, and once you have cut the serosa, you can see the capsule. and that is also blanched so that's a very good sign and then once with some amount of pressure traction counter traction we go ahead and put in the myoma screw and fix it and obviously we just pull it out nicely it comes out remember to see that the base is cut properly it is cauterized it is coagulated properly so that there is no further bleeding which occurs and nicely it is just pulled off and once this procedure is done we go ahead and park the fibroid nicely so you can see now the uterus is little pinkish in color that blanching effect has gone and once you are very sure you go ahead and start suturing we suture from below and come upwards once we come towards the serosa we take those typical baseball sutures mind you that the hemostasis has to be achieved very properly nicely and there has to be a proper approximation once you do that you can see that i am taking a bigger and deeper bites i am not going just closing the edges of serosa i am going little 1 and 1/2 to 2 cm so that i i am approximating the dead space so that there is no collection later on of a hematoma which usually forms and can get infected so we are using your bab sutures they lock themselves and then once this is done you can morselate out nicely you can do endo bag morselation so that is what i would like to show you here they are available on my channel and we can go ahead and do this thank you so much for this presentation of the video now we cover this with interseed so that there are no adhesions which are formed or there are no further adhesions which are there we go ahead with the case presentation now and we can see the slides of the case presentation so i request now dr nandita palchetkar to please come in and we have this case now a young woman who is anxious to be ready i want the case 3 to be shown case 3 thank you so if this young woman who is married and she is anxious to conceive dr nandita what will be the line of treatment i think i will allow her to conceive with this subserosal uh, myoma i you know we know that so many patients have conceived with this there's been absolutely no problem with fibroids in pregnancy except that you may get some pain during the first trimester early first trimester but otherwise i would just allow her to conceive now the case is that if she has had three or four attempts of ivf which have failed then in those cases i go in for a myomectomy in those cases but subserous and fibroid will not cause any problem in fertility it is only it will cause problems in your labor the positioning of the fetus obstetric complications but certainly not fertility niranjan i think niranjan wants to uh, you know provoke more and more and say how often we will say no 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 so what women want <laughs> is you know we will reassure her convince her that uh, the way we have counseled her is quite appropriate and she should be able to uh, like turn around yeah hema so yeah. is it that what women what women only know or men can know <laughs> no men want to know how much we are firm on our decision <laughs> and always we are not meddling for unnecessarily on uh, the cases yes niranjan yeah i agree <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> So, Dr. Linda, would you like to add here anything, Dr. Alka, from your point of view, that we should do hysteroscopy even if there is a subserosal fibroid, or we should just go ahead with a laparoscopy? Well, I, in this particular case, if there are no symptoms, uh, I, we always say first do no harm. 
Uh, and I tell my patients, I cannot fix what's not broken. So fibroids, you know, 60 to 80% of women have them. And most women are asymptomatic. And I agree with everyone that if they're not bothering the patient, that nothing needs to be done. Uh, we should reassure her that they're like most women um, who have fibroids. And I totally agree, unless there's a a time that you realize that she is having infertility and it can be from many different things what I blame the fibroids. So I'm of the opinion, leave, well, I, I can't fix what's not broken. Just leave it alone. I can only do harm. Whether I refer her for imaging with a HIFU or MRI focus ultrasound or surgery, everything has some risk. And, um, you know, I, I agree. I would do nothing about it unless there's a problem. Thank you for summarizing and we have got different perspective from all four of you. It was a wonderful discussion. Thank you very and, much. Yeah. And we go ahead with the next case now. And I request uh, this case to be taken by uh, Dr. Rishma Pai. Are you there, madam? Please go ahead. Yes. So we have a 25 year old uh, married lady with an ultrasound showing a significantly thick endometrium of 21 millimeters. That's huge. Uh, so, so diagnosis and how do we manage? So we'll start with uh, Dr. Linda. Uh, of course, she's a young lady and such a thick endometrium. Uh, we don't have here her um, menstrual cycle, but I'm sure her cycle is really delayed and which is why the endometrium is that thick. So what would be the first step for you? Okay, so if the, if the menstrual cycles are delayed, then I would think that it's an anovulatory uh, cause of bleeding. Um, knowing the pattern of bleeding, because even in anovulatory women, um, some will go months and months and months without a period. Other people just bleed incessantly. So uh, really drilling down on um, the type of bleeding is important. You know, uh, and also I would uh, probably with something like this, we'll put a hysteroscope in. Uh, you can look to see if indeed it's a polyp. You can have coexisting things. Women that are yes. anovulatory have a higher potential of developing endometrial polyps due to hyperestrogenic state or if they're overweight. And um, you'll be able to take care of everything. You can do a, just a generalized biopsy because you may also get uh, our pathologists will read desynchronous endometrium, disordered proliferative endometrium, exaggerated proliferative endometrium. It would be rare in a 25-year-old to have cancer or endometrial hyperplasia. Yeah. But if her issue is bleeding, again, I get back to uh, the ultrasound shows a normal uterus, no fibroids. I would then put in a hysteroscope in the office, take a look. Does it look symmetric? Is there a focal lesion? Um, and then decide what to do in terms of treatment. Um, and so uh, I, that would be my recommendation. I have recommend. a question think, related to that. Like, um, so supposing this girl has two months amenorrhea, and that's why the endometrium is very thick. And you, of course, want to put in a hysteroscope, and I would do the same to see if there's any polyp or something like that. But would you give her a withdrawal bleeding? Let the endometrium be shed. Let it be much thinner, and then do a hysteroscope. It is more likely to pick up... Um, abnormalities then? Or would you put a scope in uh, even after a couple of months of amenorrhea uh, with a thick endometrium? Yeah, it's a hard question. I think your proposed medical treatment after two months is reasonable. Um, so yeah, I, I would echo what you just said. And then again, have a, a timed visit to the office. Don't just give her an appointment in two weeks. Just tell her yes. to call the office when she starts her period yes. and then try to see her um, when her period's over. I always jokingly tell my patients when the tissue is thick, we really can't see in there. And after a period, yes. I tell them I want their inside of their uterus to be like a ball headed, a ball head, no hair yeah. so that yeah. you can see it should be, you know, so, any, so anything better. that shows up and they get that. I said, don't come if you're just a few days before your period or still bleeding a lot because I'm not going to see. Let's get you in it. Sometimes you have to have a flexible office schedule to let people in canc late cancellations because they're bleeding or their period didn't start. Yeah. But I really would want to get it when the endometrium is very thin because yes. if it is still thick after your proposed uh, progestin, then I'm more concerned about what it could be. Good. So Dr. Alka, 
uh, on the same line. So after her menstrual period, now if the endometrium, say you see her just after she stopped bleeding and, you know, three or four days after the bleeding, the endometrium is pretty normal. Would you just observe a couple of more cycles or would you still go back and look to see why it was 21 millimeters thick at that point? Well, I would uh, actually uh, take her up for a sonography. And then, of course, uh, if it is a smooth endometrium, which is uh, not as thick, the endomyometrial junction is good, uh, I would actually wait. But uh, in more often with the 25, 25-year-old lady in a 21-millimeter uh, annulate yeah, cycle, uh, we do have an experience of having polyps inside the uterine cavity. They could, in fact, even be sessile polyp. And like Dr. Bradley said, it could be two conditions. It could be chronic endometritis uh, with a polyp. It could be a polyp, which is very, it has got a lot of inflammation on it. So, you know, it's going to show up as a thick endometrium. Uh, a hysteroscopic evaluation would surely be uh, needed in case postmenstrually as well, there is a, a thickening of the endometrium. But surely I would look at the endomyometrial junction as well. Wonderful. So I think that's very important because she's young. We are not really considering a cancer, but even a very thick endometrium, very strong possibilities of either chronic anovulation or a polyp or uh, any one of these things. And uh, uh, of course, it is really about whether a patient is having ovulatory or anovulatory bleeding. And, you know, that has come into this particular question. But essentially, I think the most important feature would be the regularity of the cycles. Ovulatory cycles are more often regular. Anovulatory cycles are usually irregular, delayed, then continuous bleeding. Could be very short, could be very long cycles, uh, erratic pattern of flow. Very often the patient have uh, evidence of polycystic ovarian syndrome, could be thin or obese PCOs. And of course, the extremes of age, you know, so 25 year old is unlikely to have a typical anovulatory pattern unless she's polycystic, uh, more likely to be in the adolescent or the perimenopausal age group. So uh, I think um, we've pretty much sorted this question out. What I uh, sometimes, you know, that the debate comes in when the girl is a little bit older. For example, if this girl was 40 years old with that endometrium, then you would be a lot more concerned. And I would typically give her a withdrawal bleeding, see how it is. If it's very thin postmenstrual, maybe wait till mid-cycle. So call her back at about 14th, 15th day to see if the endometrium is really becoming very, very thick again, and then uh, take an opinion. So I think management would be a little bit more interventional if this lady was closer to, say, 40 or uh, around that age, right? Right. Yeah. And the other thing is to, you know, the older the patients get or at any time, making sure they're not on any other medicines uh, like tamoxifen, while it often thins the endometrium, yes. it can make it thicker. You also have to take a family history. Uh, you know, endometrial cancer uh, is common, but more often in women in their 60s. But I always ask, was there a family history of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, early colon cancer, um, the syndrome, the uh, Lynch syndrome may put a patient at increased risk. So uh, how many years have they had anovulatory cycles? I mean, we everything's very anecdotal. I remember at our institution a few years ago, I had in one year about 10 young women under 30 with endometrial cancer. But when you looked at them, they were very obese. Um, yeah. I'm never good at converting, but they were between three and 400 pounds. They never had normal menstrual cycles. And so you have to look at the timing of, you know, two months of abnormal bleeding, I'm less worried about cancer, but a lifelong history of abnormal bleeding and a strong family history of early uterine cancers and other um, <coughs> diseases, you know, um, could cause, put her at greater risk. So to think about yeah. those. I think today mm -hmm. we are seeing so much of polycystic ovarian syndrome, so much yes. of obesity, so things have caused a change. You know, we would normally not consider in young girls, but with PCO from the time they're 15 years old, they've been having irregular cycles. By the time yes. they're 30, they've had 15 years of uh, irregular delayed menses and so putting themselves at risk of uh, endometrial cancer. So we do have to keep our eyes open uh, constantly. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think we can go on to the next uh, question. Thank you. Uh, thank no, you, Reshma. You about 40-year-old, no? Remember the premenopausal and the postmenopausal women, even vaginal estrogen at a lot of times, they're using it, they don't bother to tell you about it. So that is also something which you must keep in mind when you have an older patient. 
Uh, not only that, uh, Nandita, don't you? Many of the patients are put on different, different progesterone hormones indefinitely, intermittently, mix and match. Actually, most of them sometimes we find it's only the pill induced endometrium, which is think uh, in most of this age group also. This is a way of, that's also been an observation. And sometimes when we do get the HP report, it is that hormonal effect on the endometrium, which is, we have been seeing. And the other thing I would add, I just think as a teaching point, when we have a patient come to us who's been on multiple medications, birth control pills, progestin therapy, and they don't respond medically like we think, and they have a thickened endometrium, just put your hysteroscope in there and look. Because we know if she had been put on birth control pills and did well, that um, it's unlikely to have an intracavitary lesion. So for me, I always ask what's been tried. You know, when they bring, bring in a bag of um, pills and patches of things, uh, different things, and they're still bleeding, we need to just take a look. Um, and we always come out, people will think we're brilliant doctors. It's like a, a woman with vulvar itching. And she comes in with a purse, a bag full of ointments that she's put on her vulva, and no one's ever taken a biopsy. And then we take a biopsy and find she has lichen sclerosis. Oh, my God, they think you're brilliant. So take the history. What has she been? If she didn't respond and she's been diligent, then you have to look in the cavity. So that's another part of the history I like to, to take. Thank you, all of you. I would like to tell you that we have got more than 4,150 registered doctors oh. watching us live. And Dr. Linda, you have been here with us for more than two hours. We can understand that you are there sitting with us and sharing your experience. So we would still request you to be there with us for some time because there are many questions being asked. And I want to tell you all that you are also amazing that we have questions not only from India, but from Cairo, from Egypt, from Nepal and from Southeast Asia. So please be with us. And I want to tell the audience, thank you. You made us all. And you have been here sitting and looking at us, hearing us. And I thank you for more than 200 questions which you have asked. But we are going to take only a few of them. And there is an audience poll. Please do, rock, please do write on that and give your opinion and suggestion. Dr. Shanta, you want to say something? Yes. I there thought, is a picture which you have yes. sent, please. <laughs> I, this, is an, this is a beautiful picture to a beautiful girl in this panel. I thought I should show this, OK? Oh, so, <laughs> Alka, this is a special picture by your friend from Hyderabad. So I thought I should oh, my. send it <laughs> that to show you that everyone is enjoying the panel. Okay, so Shobha says hi to you. Thank you so very much. Thank you so <laughs> much. It was so Great nice to know. Thank yeah. you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. Eva, madam, now, now let's have some fun. Come. <laughs> <laughs> no, Niranjan, what I, seriously, what I wanted to say was your poll showed that 97% of the audience do want a full-fledged uh, session on hysteroscope. So uh, as Linda and Alka have pointed out time and again throughout this discussion, that it's a simple thing to do. And the scale of use, you know, within the gynecologist segment is far from, you know, being nearly there. And um, the potential of what it can offer by scaling up the use is so very well laid out by both the experts uh, on this panel. We really, really appreciate that. So I do think that the conversion of how many people are seeing, how many people actually take the next step of moving into doing and scaling up the use of uh, an office hysteroscope is really, that's the kind of uh, poll we need to take next. And so I think this has been very um insightful the fun part i was saying is niranjan knows that i have a syndrome called can't keep quiet syndrome 
<laughs> so he wants to provoke me again and again to see whether I will do something with the case. I'll do something with the <laughs> with the case. So that was a fun part because he had put up the fifth case, which also, you know, somewhat tending towards don't do anything <laughs> with that. So he wants to teach me a special lesson today. Of sometimes you have to keep quiet. He has taught you. He has made you sit for two hours, ten minutes. Yeah, one chair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sitting on my chair since four o'clock, three o'clock. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What I would like to say is, uh, in in India, uh, of course, more and more people are doing hysteroscopy now. Obviously, a lot more laparoscopy, and even today there are cases of infertility where they do a laparoscopy and don't put in a hysteroscope, which I think is criminal. However, the cases or the percentage of people doing an actual office hysteroscopy yeah. is very less. Yeah. So we may use a microhistroscope, but still it is being done in the operation theatre very often under anesthesia. Uh, so that I think is something which Indians need to take up in a big way: actual office hystroscopy, which is done in your outpatient, which uh, is not very common. Very very few people are doing it. Yeah, Rishma. Only our foreign patients agree to office hystroscopy. Yes. Yes. All the Indian girls say, "No, please, yeah. no, just give yeah. me anesthesia. Yeah. I can handle yeah. it." Yeah. Cost. Nobody is going yeah. to pay you if you do it in your uh, consulting room. Yes, that's another. Indian that's psyche another. is different. The Indian yes. psyche is different. Yes. So what is the and, examination yeah. you've done? Yeah. Yeah, and you know the whole uh, the whole uh, thing about evaluating in the office. And then fixing her for an actual operative hysteroscopy yeah. in the OT. You know, so it becomes like two procedures, which yeah. I really don't see our Indian patients accepting very well. Having said that, we do a lot of office hysteroscopy, but in the OT. So no speculum, no valsalam. Directly use a dial, uh, you know, a small uh, micro hysteroscope. Put it inside without any dilatation. So all the procedures of the office hysteroscope, but done in uh, the operation theatre. Yeah. So there's no pain to the patient. Patient has all the benefits or the comfort, but uh, yeah, cases of office actual hysteroscopy are less. Thank you, all of you. Now I would like to share some praises which have come from all over the world. Dr. Sunil Sharma, very very thankful to all of you for conducting such a wonderful webinar. I have really learned a lot. It has also helped me clear some of my doubts. Dr. Pratap Kumar says, "Brilliant work of putting the best team always. Excellent work team, TOG and Niranjan. There is one more, Dr. Dulan Usman Mulani. He is from Satara. He says, program conducted nicely with very little disturbance. Videos of procedures are very clear. Speakers elaborated the subject nicely." All the cases were dealt with with proper diagnosis and management. POG, MAG, AGL is an excellent show, especially with Dr. Niranjan. With oh, all wow. this, <laughs> with all these praises, this comes to you, all of you. We have got more than one fifty questions, so I will start few of them, and we will just take very important and pertinent questions. So we start. With Niranjan, I I think we have to say who said women only want praises, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, 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 Madam Dr. Linda, there is a question for you, and uh, anyone can also take this. What are the types of performing hysteroscopy with Valsalam holding the cervix? Is it easy or just guiding the hysteroscope? Through the cervical canal is easy. Can you elaborate on this? This is Dr. Yeah. Nitya Sank. Okay. Currently, I do not use a tenaculum or rarely use a tenaculum. Our hysteroscope is 3.2 millimeters. It's flexible. And just like with operative hysteroscopy, we look at the landmarks as we insert the hysteroscope. And I tell my residents, we're just kind of first just looking for the black hole. So you have to get used to manipulating the cervix. Some cervices are very tortuous. Others are straight in. So you just have to look. And then you look from the lower uterine segment. You can see both tubal ostia. So the question is, I usually do not dilate all the time. I, I don't put a tenaculum on. The, the answer would be, I would not be truthful if I said I never did it. But if I have 100 cases... 
probably 97 out of 100, I do not need to put a tenaculum on or a dilator. Years ago when I first started, because that's what I saw being done, everybody, and it was uncomfortable. Um, I do have a study that was published over 400 of my patients where we did a, just a visual analog, asking them on a scale of zero to five what their pain was. Um, and most women said that it was less than a menstrual cramp. And nowadays, if we are scheduling, as Alka mentioned, teaching them, I have a handout that I wrote. We have them to eat before coming, to take a couple of, uh, we would call it uh, an NSAID, uh, an hour or two before coming. I do not do a paracervical block, but I think the small diameter scope and a prepared patient um, is very, very helpful. So just getting to know your landmarks is the important thing. Dr. Linda, can I ask you a question? In India, we sure. don't really use flexible hysteroscopes because we are scared that they're very, very delicate and they will not last very long and we can't afford to replace hysteroscopes very quickly. How many cases does your uh, flexible hysteroscope last you? Oh, God, the one I have has been 10 years. Really? I mean, yeah. because we have an office staff that has learned how to clean them. Um, we That's had a awesome. couple of doctors early on who were putting a grasper at the end of the scope to push it into the cervix and they were breaking all the fibers. So I think it's just education. Um, we don't let anyone clean it. So I think it's like taking care of anything that we own here. Um, you know, if you don't do it right, um, if you put something in the dishwasher that's not supposed to be in the dishwasher, it's going to melt. So um, our, my, my flexible scope is my workhorse. Um, you know, we just hand it to each other very carefully, pass it back. I mean, we treat it like a piece of china. I mean, we take yeah. really good care of it. So how many mm -hmm. do you have in your office for the kind of workload oh, you're doing massive uh, amount of work? You know, it's interesting. Now I have to have, we have nine. Um, I used to have three, but our, we used to be able to stare us, us our scopes, um, but the the hospital now is saying that we have to do with the device that we have, the hospital rules is to gas sterilize it. So that's 24 hours. Right. So um, we have nine flexible. I have about four rigid. And wow. then we've recently yeah. pur purchased um, some of the disposable um, ones that I showed pictures of. Because sometimes um, this, it's happened, we get patients from all over the country, all over the world, and somebody may be scheduled as a new patient, but they really were scheduled as, should have been scheduled as a hysteroscope. So it's horrible to run out of scopes. So we do have a backup, but the majority of the time it's a flexible scope. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Linda. I want Thank to you put so in, I want to Niranjan, because of this office hysteroscope, I have lost my ability to use a dilator. <laughs> I'm so scared now to use the dilator because I'm so happy with the visual visualization. So we just go like this, like this. I mean, it's beautiful. It's mm -hmm. if the minute people start using it, it is unbelievable instrument. So I just yeah. can't, I get very scared to use the dilators now. Absolutely. Uh, there is a role of pain sensation in women who undergo office hysteroscopy and Dr. Amira Shoaib from Egypt would like to know whether local anesthetic has to be used at the tip of the hysteroscope. Dr. Linda or Alka or anyone? No, we've, I never, I've never used it. No. Well, I've okay. a lot. I have, I forgot how to do paracervical blocks. I just don't use it. And okay. so, you know, it's just, it's pretty amazing. Um, I think when you get a skill set that many of my patients say, oh my God, you're done. Or they've gone to have an endometrial pipel biopsy in the past with another doctor. And, you know, literally, uh, I'm, I, I do think it's like a colonoscopy. You, it's, it's not, I'm not in a race, okay? You shouldn't say, oh, I can do this in 30 seconds. No, I want to say that I saw everything, that I deflated the uterus, that I've looked at the endocervix, that I know what, the history is, what am I trying, what do I think is a puzzle piece putting together? So we're not in a race, um, but it does take little time to do this. And um, it's a great, uh, you've all, we are, we're all um, believers of hysteroscopy. And I think we're all believers and wonder 
how is it that a doctor would not use this tool like a stethoscope? I mean, it is, and now with the new disposable ones, you could just be in any room. You don't need a tower. You don't need to have an extra light source. You could be anywhere. You could be in the emergency room and do this. Um, you could be in the intensive care unit with a postmenopausal bleeding that's ventilated, that's having bleeding. You can just put her on a bedpan and look inside the uterus. So it doesn't even have to be in your office. So it's pretty remarkable, of it. especially I'm speaking of the disposable technology that has a light. It has the, you don't need a tower. It's the size of your phone. Uh, it's there. Uh, Linda, with EndoC, and I know you're talking about the uh, EndoC and the uh, Lina. Uh, do yes. you find do you and Luminel? That's just yeah. come out this yeah. this week. So, do mm -hmm. you find do you find the image quality uh, as good as uh, what uh, what uh, uh, our regular hysteroscopy uh, gives you? I think that the regular hysteroscopes with a rod lens are clearer. Um, yeah. I mean, if that's a yes no answer, but it's still if someone doesn't have it. I still think that we can um, be able to yeah. get the answers to questions. So, I'll, you know, there's a little bit of a change, um, but the, yeah. I think I would rather a doctor use that than use a DNC okay. or a blind biopsy. Mm -hmm. I, agree. I agree completely. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Linda. I'm just going to be there for a few more questions to you because you have been staying here for a long time. Okay. So, yeah, then I'll have will, to finish with you. Uh, there are many, many questions which have been asked, especially in the last 30 minutes since the Q&A session has started. 380 doctors have joined us, but I'll just go through some few questions. Uh, Linda, ma'am, do you suggest hysteroscopy for retained products of conception and not DNC? Why and how? That is the first question. Second is, how do you deal with false passage during hysteroscopy. This is from Dr. Bishwa Prakash Choudhury. And the first regarding RPOCs is by Dr. Roshan Gongal. Yes, Thank you. So again, I think the issue for retained products of conception is when. If a woman just had a baby and is hemorrhaging, you cannot do a hysteroscopy, at least in my experience. So what I'm speaking of are the Use of hysteroscopy six, eight, 10, 12 weeks later, even months later, uh, related to bleeding. Because by then the uterus has um, um, become small again, uh, the cervix is closed, and you put the hysteroscope in and you see the images that I saw. Often the uh, tissue is small, um, and you can then use at our hospital, we have a tissue retrieval system. I think in the U.S. there are four companies, and I won't name them, but they're tissue retrieval systems. Or before the tissue retrieval systems became um, available, I would use my rigid hysteroscope, not turn on any heat, and use my wire loop as I, could, I would dictate it as a cold, C-O-L-D, loop resection. So you just, the tissue is just necrotic. You can just push it away if you just have a resectoscope. Otherwise, the mechanical morselation suctions the tissue in and you're only dealing with the tissue on one wall. You don't need to touch anything else because the rest, there's no tissue. And there's a couple of studies, and I'm so sorry I can't give credit to the authors, but they've looked at um, doing a removal of retained products with a tissue retrieval system, less um, scar tissue when you look uh, six, eight, 12 weeks later and it takes care of the condition. The thing I would say when you do hysteroscopy on retained products, definitely use your vasopressin, use your fluid management system. For me, it's anecdotal, but it seems like there may be a little bit more fluid absorption more quickly. So get in, do the work, take it out and be prepared. The uterus is still, even when it involutes, is a little softer. So be careful about perforation. So I see clearly the risk of adhesions, uh, not I, our, our infertility doctors see the women who've had two or three blind DNCs, they keep bleeding, and there's just a small a bit of retained product. You take that out and they stop. So um, that's what I would advocate, either is always directed. And I hope that this new generation of young 
doctors that are starting in their residency here in the States in July, when they leave our hands here at Cleveland Clinic, that they think about it and know the risk benefit profile of why the tissue retrieval system would be better utilized than a sharp blind curatage. Because you see what you get and you leave everything else alone. I'm so Thank sorry, you. there was another question. Um, I missed it or forgot what it was. It was, uh, it was regarding why not do DNC for a retained products of conception? Oh. But I think you have yeah. gone through it already. There was a question on the false passage. What do you do when a oh, false yeah, passage false is passage. created? Well, you have to be careful with the false passage. So again, try to predict the cases where that's more likely to occur. You know, someone that's had a leap or cone, someone that's never had kids, someone that's had a bunch of C-sections, someone that's a menopausal. Uh, false passages, if you're doing operative hysteroscopy, and ALCA can speak to this, uh, increases your risk of um, fluid absorption. And obviously, if you do a false passage anteriorly, you can put a hole in the bladder, or you can get out to the sides and get a hematoma. So you have to look at your landmarks. If you don't see tubal ostea, you just see the, um, and again, maybe with our next session, um, we can show what it looks like. The anatomy and architecture of the uterus, you should see that. If you can't see the structures in the uterus, then you need to back out and then redirect your scope. You find the channel like Alka said, where the fluid is going. I always tell my residents, I'm looking for the black hole because it's dark in there. And I just weave my scope uh, under direct visualization. Always, always put your scope in under direct visualization. If you're in the myometrium or the muscle fibers, it just, um, I've heard, it's hard to describe. And maybe Alka, you can describe it. It just looks like a web of tissue. It's, it's nothing like the pictures you saw. So if it doesn't look right, back up, try again. Um, and if you're not sure, stop, give them, come back another day, give them a cervical softening agent uh, to use to help to make the cervix more patchless. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We have got many questions for you. We'll get back to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, madam. It was a wonderful presentation, wonderful lecture. Dr. Hila Gupta has said, beautiful and excellent talk. Uh, Dr. Urvi has said, she has asked whether the POC turns malignant. Madam, any, any reference you have of malignancy of uh, retained products of conception coming up later after 20 years, 15 years, mm -hmm. like that? No. Niranjan, yeah, I, please I, I, say bye I, to everybody, please. I need to yes. leave right now. I'm very sorry. Thank you, madam. Pleasure with everybody. And Niranjan, I have to run. Thank you, madam. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. Bye -bye. See you Thank you. Bye. And I'll have to say the same thing um, just for timing. I personally have not seen product <laughs> conception become malignant years later. I, I just don't know the, excuse me, know the answer to that. But that I don't know. But I do want to just thank everybody um, for um, inviting me. And I want to also thank our crew here at the Cleveland Clinic who came in on a holiday weekend. Um, probably a beautiful, our first, we had snow here less than two wow. weeks ago. So we've got a great weekend ahead with, uh, we do a lot of barbecuing and well, we can't even be with families like we used to, but um, maybe by Zoom, but may you all be safe and stay healthy and, um, let us continue to be friends and colleagues. And I always say every culture, we are linked with each other and let us keep our friendship, the family spirit that we have. Let us continue to educate women because it's doctors like you and like us that really give of our time, our talent, and all of the techniques that we use to help others. We're not perfect. Uh, I can bring you some pictures of things I've seen down through the years surgically. <laughs> mishaps. And I always say, if it happened to me once, may I talk about it? I'm not embarrassed because I want it not to happen to someone else. And, um, and um, that's how we learn in medicine. And at the Cleveland Clinic, we say we are teams of team. So that's what I would say here. What a great team. All of you have worked really, really hard to put a spectacular program on. I wish I could stay a little longer, but thank you. And I do hope that we can meet face to face one day again, and I'm gonna go get that samosa.
thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank wonderful you. to interact okay. with you. Thank you. Thank you. I had fun. Thank yeah. you. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Doctor Ranjan, if you so wish, I took out. I. I have a may I have a picture of the false passage, uh, since that was a question. Can can I show it? Yes, madam. Yeah. So I I have put up brought up the picture. Or uh, if I will share my screen, uh, so uh, I will just show the false passage uh, since somebody wanted to see it. How it looks like. Okay. Last copy. If you can show no no issues, otherwise we'll come back to you soon. Okay, uh, Madam Shanta and uh, Rishma Hema, Madam, there are many questions, but we will just quickly go through uh, them. Uh, if she is a woman who is thirty five years old, para two, and she complains of irregular bleeding for more than six months. so how would you go about and treat this this is from dr jyotir mai bajna from mumbai she is 32 years with irregular bleeding yes irregular bleeding and ultrasound has been also done it it shows that the et is uh, about uh, 12 mm in size yeah some of this if ultrasound and anything else everything is normal sometimes you know there may be iatrogenic lot of drugs and hormone this tablets and all being used you know uh, we we actually have the tendency sometimes we see prescriptions where the patients are put on two or two three days of progesterone and then left left okay nobody is actually probably we have to see if it was an misuse of drugs or uh, not used properly so that could be one reason and uh, otherwise as uh, the other thing was you need to find out probably if that is not so no harm please go ahead and do an office hysteroscopy do a biopsy get a histopathological report and then treat her with your if that's normal then we can do the medical management with uh, progesterone so no yes. niranjan for these yes madam hema and then reshma yeah, yeah we need a lot of other inputs for the case yeah, i know to, yeah properly uh, document a lot of things inclusive Difficult. from starting from the bmi yeah. to the uh, regularity of the meds or hemoglobin and uh, what other investigations hormone tests this that and the other then comprehensively we can decide on what really uh, to do with her and coming back to your question what women wants so what does she want to do when does she wants a pregnancy doesn't want a pregnancy <laughs> <laughs> all of those you know they, it has to be uh, when we say individualized these are the kind of cases where we really need to spend a little more time to uh, just structure uh, how we would uh, move ahead with her yeah hmm. yeah dr reshma last word and then we will go and close i think there is definitely uh, i agree with what hema said there's fairly inadequate uh, information Uh, depending on her fertility status what she wants to do any other pathology uh, there otherwise uh, the simplest thing really would be a hormone management a combination hormone pill would typically care, take care of almost all kind of irregular cycles provided of course you ruled out that the patient doesn't have uh, any um, sort of contraindication to contraceptive combined contraceptive pills that would be my first line of treatment if all other things are uh, ruled out and she doesn't want a uh, uh, conception Thank you, Doctor Eshma. Thank you, Shanta. Thank you, yes. Hema, Madam, Alka, Madam, and uh, we will close it now. Yes, Mr. Rakul. Thank you Mr. very Rakul. much. Thank you. I think it was really uh, an interesting yeah. session. Very well conducted, as usual, Niranjan. I think now you can be woken up in the middle of the night and you'll start a very good uh, panel uh, session. So thank you for that, and a very Madam. special thank you to uh, Mr. Atul Suri for uh, hosting this wonderful uh, event for us and for our audience. Thank you. Yeah. So Madam thank you, Niranjan, for getting Madam. us all together and yes. promising another big event very soon. Thank you. <laughs> I was just like to step in here. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can be heard. Yes, yes. we can. Yes. Uh, wonderful uh, i just want to take this opportunity uh, to even thank uh, the audience uh, for the people who don't know who i am my name is atul suri and i represent alembic pharmaceuticals and alembic has had the honor to be associated with such a lovely forum knowledge beyond boundaries the international webinar series and going by the huge number of gynecologists who have participated not just today but in the previous knowledge uh, sessions that we've had i am indeed overwhelmed by 
its impact. In the very first webinar, we had Dr. Lee Wine from Singapore, where over 6,500 gynecologists attended. In the second one, Dr. Yoon from South Korea drew in more than 5,000 doctors, with the majority of them being the ones who had attended the first one. This is definitely a sure indication of the acceptance of this format. Yes. I'm told we have over 4,200 doctors viewing this webinar today. I, I have always believed that the success of any webinar lies on two major pillars, the content and, of course, the speakers. And I dare say, Olympics webinars have been fortunate to have top-rate speakers who've come with hugely relevant content. I must also say that the segment on case discussions also contributes significantly to the value of a scientific session such as this, since we've had the best of practitioners in the world sharing their clinical experiences with all of you. Going by the interest generated in the fraternity of gynecologists, Olympic would be keen on bringing to you all again more such webinars. If there is a topic that you would like to know more about, do let Olympic's medical representatives know when he or she comes calling on you next. I would be failing in my duty if I do not acknowledge the huge contribution of Subu and his team at Science Integra, our eminent panelists, of course, all the doctors who've taken time out to join us, and not last but not the least, our most charismatic moderator, Dr. Niranjan Chavan, to whom I shall hand the session over to once again. Thank you all once more for being part of Olympic's Knowledge Beyond Boundaries webinar. We hope to see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. I appreciate, Thank you. and I appreciate all of you to be here joining us on this Saturday weekend. And this platform is highly charged with <laughs> your omnip omnipotent presence and that elegance and that beauty and the charm and the intelligence of all of you have flowed. And I thank each one of you, Dr. Nandita Palchetkar, Dr. Hema Divakar, Dr. Shanta Kumari, Dr. Rishma Poe. Dr. Alka Kumar and Dr. Linda, who was with us, and obviously Alembic and the audience and Science Indigra team. Thank you so much. We will meet soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. I think Mr. Thank you. Atul's, Atul's uh, military background also brought in some discipline in the <laughs> program. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to more of these interactions, and we'll be more than happy to sort of associate with this forum. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.